Good evening. Welcome uh, back to the power of our story. Uh, tonight, we have a really special guest. We have somebody who's done so much for the community and has daily impact to this day. Um, he's a real powerhouse from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. He's got about a million years as a Las Vegas Metro uh, police officer, he retired as a lieutenant. Uh, a, million, he's, uh, a million years, really? A, mil <laughs> a million. In, in cop years, it's like a million, brother. It's like a million. <laughs> and when you become the staple of Las Vegas, like you are, where everybody knows, you're kind of an icon, brother. So I got to give you the million years. <laughs> but gotcha. you don't look today over 45. <laughs> uh, but it's a real treat to have you. Um, and if I could get you just to tell a little bit of story about you, introduce who you are, how you came to be where you're at, and 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 the some of the suffering and and um, recovery that you've done. So you don't mind if I have a co-host, do you? You always do. I see that cat often. <laughs> he, one of one of my six cats. Six. I am. I'm the crazy cat man. I really am. <laughs> so yeah, let me. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you the. I'll give you a little history. Um, I spent 34 years as a police officer. I began my career at the ripe old age of 19 as a uh, police officer in Princeton, New Jersey, and uh, the story of how my career began is is um, is a little interesting and a little bittersweet. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fill you in on that. I was, I was uh, uh, in a small town. Princeton was my hometown. I grew up there. And the way I got hired by the police department as a cadet when I was 17 was I was being suspended from high school. And I was in the principal's office being suspended for, I know this will shock you, fighting again. And um, so while I was in, in, the, in the principal's office waiting for my parents to come pick me up, um, the principal, even though he would suspended me several times for fighting, he knew that I, every time I got in a fight, I was protecting someone else. And I had a thing about bullies that has carried with me throughout my entire life because criminals are bullies. And so I was being suspended again. And... Every year, the police department would hire a junior as a cadet. And so while I'm in the office being thrown out of school again, I, the, chief, the principal was getting a phone call, and I could tell from the conversation, it was with the chief of police. And they were talking about the new, you know, they were going to get ready to hire a new cadet. And I'm going like this. And the, and the principal got this funny smile on his face. He said, Chief, I think I have the perfect cadet for you. And that's how I got hired by the police department as a cadet. Now, what's a cadet in a small town, right? I was the coffee boy. I'd make the coffee. I would run errands. I would. Uh, I, I got introduced to all the police officers, a 30-officer police department. I would work the desk, which meant I would answer phones. I would dispatch cars along with the, whatever police officer was there. So I got to know all the, all the officers. We got to be friends. And one of the officers who I worked a lot with was a guy named Johnny. And Johnny was um, on the verge of retirement. He was this crusty old Vietnam veteran who uh, put on the air of being, you know, this rough, tough guy. But he was truly one of those people with a heart of gold, right? And although he, he played the tough guy, he kind of took me under his wing and, and uh, taught me how to work the desk, taught me how to answer the phones, how to be calm in situations. And so we had a, we had a really nice relationship. So I, I spent a couple of years, as, I spent a year as a cadet sworn in as what they call a special officer. And which just meant that I, I had some semblance of, I had a uniform, I wore a badge that said special police and I could do certain duties. So after I graduated from high school, um, which I had to do early, because they were going to expel me for all my suspensions. So I took an extra course load. I graduated early from high school, and then I turned 18. Well, they just changed the age of majority in New Jersey from 21 to 18. So now I'm, I have a high school, I have a high school uh, uh, diploma, 
and I'm 18, which meant that I could actually test for police departments. Now, nobody was hiring an 18-year-old cop. They didn't even think about it when they changed the age of majority. You could drink, you could vote, you could become a cop. And so I tested when the police department had an opening. Now, they knew they weren't going to hire me, but they, generally speaking, only hired a cop once every three or four years. So out of all the people that took the police test, there were several hundred, um, they made me number two on the list, never, ever expecting to hire me. So I'm now going to college. Um, I've got, I'm, I'm working a part-time job. And when they needed me, they would call me in at the police department. Well, there was a hurricane in New Jersey and it was a, it was a real bad, bad storm. And I knew they were going to need me. So I went in to help out and work the desk. And uh, so I'm, I'm answering phones. It's crazy. Trees are coming down everywhere. It's flooding. There's people stuck. I mean, it was a, it was, it was an all hands on deck situation. So um, Johnny Marcus and Johnny was supposed to relieve the desk officer from the seven to three shift. And he didn't show up. And everybody's thinking, okay, probably because the trees are down, he's coming in, he couldn't make it into, into town. And this is before cell phones, of course. So we just didn't have any communication with him. And we're just assuming that he couldn't make it in. So, you know, things are crazy. I'm answering the phone, I'm dispatching cars, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And in a lull in the action, I ran down to the locker room to use the bathroom. And Johnny was on the floor. He had come in and he had a heart attack and he died on the floor of the locker room. And uh, I yelled up for help and I started CPR on him and uh, couldn't revive him. And Johnny died that day in the, in the locker room. And the ambulance gets there and they take him and we're all sitting there literally in shock, you know? And uh, when the sergeant walks up to me and he says, hell of a way to become a cop, huh, kid? And that's how my career began. So that was, uh, that was a hell of a way to begin my career. And I got hired and I stayed there for 10 years. And, you know, it was a, it was a uh, small town. Um, I did six years on patrol, four years as a detective. I was at the top of my pay grade, but I got to tell you, I was bored to death. And I knew that if I didn't leave then to follow my dream of more action, I would never leave because I was literally halfway to retirement now and uh, decided it was time. And so I left and joined the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and uh, was no longer bored and began my career all over again. I had to go through the academy. I had to literally begin my entire career all over again. And then I spent 24 years with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I never looked back on that decision. It was, uh, it was, it was a difficult decision to make um, for a lot of different reasons, including leaving my family behind. I didn't know a soul in Vegas, but I felt like I needed more challenges. And so uh, uh, in, in the immortal words, uh, be careful what you wish for. And, uh, and, and began my career all over again in Vegas. So before you get into the Las Vegas chapter that, can I stop you and go back to just one second? You experienced that initial trauma of seeing not just a fatality, but a coworker. How did you deal with that? Or did you at all or recognize it in that moment as a young 18 year old kid? I instantly recognized it. It was it was a pivotal moment. It was a pivotal moment in my life. Here I'm literally trying to save the life of 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 this crusty guy who who really took me under his wing and 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 I was he was my friend. And uh realizing the frailty of life um impacted me even at that young age. And, uh, and, and, that, and that story has stuck with me. I mean, I believe me, um, those images, there are certain images that stay with you forever as a cop. 
And that is one of those images that, that has stayed with me my entire career. And, and I also don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe that, you know, uh, you know, whatever your spiritual beliefs are, I don't believe that, that things don't happen for a reason. And, uh, and I believe that that, that was the path that I was supposed to take and that that path as, as painful as it was, uh, began with that particular tragedy. And how did you deal with that in that moment? What was the, 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 the forced way or the expressed way by your coworkers to deal with that at that time? It was, um, it was, there were some, there were a couple of guys that were, that looked at me and almost kind of with guilt, you know, me feeling guilt that, that this is the way my career began. And so, yeah, it was, a. Uh, it was something I had to, I had to learn to live with. Um, you know, I attended his funeral and, and, uh, it was, uh, it was a difficult, difficult time. And, uh, in a small police department, you know, everybody knows everybody's business. So it was, it was, um, there was a little bit of, um, kind of like a Jonah feel, you know, here's, how this 19 year old kid become a cop and Johnny died, you know? So there was a little bit of that feeling and I don't know if it was real or if it was me, but, uh, um, but it was, it, it had an impact. Then it has an impact now. Listen, I, I still, you know, it's still, it was still a, a pivotal moment in my life that I'm talking about um, literally 40 years later. So yeah, it was a, it was a moment that, uh, that, that, uh, I'll never forget. So is it safe to say that's just one of those things that maybe you didn't deal with in the moment, you kind of buried it and moved on? Yes. Yeah, I would have to say that's, um, you You know, those were the days when we never even talked about, about, you know, things that bothered you inside that you were dealing with. It was, this was, those were what we call the suck em up buttercup days. Right. And uh, and and so, yeah, that was that, that that was very much in evidence during that time. OK, and we'll probably circle back to that a bit later. You go ahead and continue on uh, with your starting your new life, uh, leaving yeah. your family in, in Las Vegas. Begin my career all over again, go through the academy and listen, going through. the. So when I first went through the academy at the New Jersey State Police Academy, I was the youngest cop there. I was the youngest cop in New Jersey. In fact, you, you know, you could become a cop, you could vote, you could drink. But one thing you couldn't do, you couldn't buy ammunition. You had to be 21. So I'm getting ready to enter the New Jersey State Police Academy, a residential academy that's one of the toughest in the country. And I had to have my mom go buy my bullets for me. <laughs> Which was something she never let me forget the rest of my, the rest of her life, right? <laughs> so um, so anyway, I go, I, I, I go back, I go into the, the Las Vegas Academy. Um, begin all over again and uh, start as a patrol officer, field training officer. I had a wonderful career with Metro. I never looked back on that decision. But now remember, I wanted action, right? That's why I left. I wanted action because there wasn't any in Princeton. Well, I'm still on probation. I'm working um, a two-man car in uh, in the uh, in the hood and um graveyard shift because where all the rookies went and get involved in a pursuit with a stolen car bunch of gangbangers in it they crash driver bails out passenger bails out my partner goes after one i go after the driver and i'm pretty good because i'm you know just out of the academy so i'm running after this kid and um and we're we're literally in the hood in a in a housing um, you know, low, low income housing, uh, development. I've got my gun in my hand and I'm running. I just can't quite catch this kid. And he runs around the corner of a, of a building and I run around the corner of the building and he's laying there waiting for me to ambush me. And he's pointing his gun, waiting for me to come around the corner. And as I come around the corner and I see him with his gun, I just, I popped a shot right at him because it was instinctual. And he was standing right next to the wall of, of the house, of, of a house. 
And when I shot, the bullet zinged right by his ear, hit the building, and a piece of stucco broke off and hit him in the head. And he thought he was shot in the head. And he couldn't wait to throw that gun down. And I scooped him up, put him into custody. And then I realized that he was 14 years old. And a 14-year-old was willing to kill me over a stolen car. Talk about a reality check. There you go, Randy. Be careful what you wish for. And uh, and that was a that was a a, a moment that um, uh, you know when you realize that you're not playing in the same sandbox you were playing in. And uh, and that was my first shooting, and I was in a number of them. So um, I do the patrol thing for a while. Um, I become a field training officer, which was one of the the highlights of my career. I stayed in field training uh, at various times during my career, literally till I retired. Field training, but for those of you who don't know, when a police officer gets out of the academy, they have to go through a field training period, and it's very structured in in the bigger police departments of six months. And during that six months, they are partnered with a senior officer like myself at the time who evaluates them and literally takes their, their uh, classroom education in the academy and tries to develop them into being an effective, safe police officer. But they can't actually you know, become certified until they go through six months of field training. And that's, that was a very, very... Uh, um, I, I took that, that job very, very seriously because it, it literally, it's where the rubber meets the road where a police officer legitimately becomes a police officer, not just going through the, the, the classroom, the academy. And it's a, it's a very, very poignant time in the lives of a young officer. Um, and, and they can fail out at any time because the education you get in the academy tries to prepare you for the street. But you can never really be prepared with facing a life and death situation until you, until you what we call face the dragon. And most cops will never face the dragon. They'll never, 95% um, police, of police officers will never use their weapon in the line of duty. And of course, nobody understands that that is the, that is the reality because from what we're conditioned to seeing in Hollywood and TV shows and all that cops are always shooting people. Well, that's not the case. But when you make that life and death decision, you better do it right. And some people don't know if they can at the, at the moment of truth. And I'll tell you more of a story about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but I, uh, I went through field training. Then I was an undercover detective, narcotics. I uh, um, became a sergeant. I did most of my career as a sergeant because that was, for me, that was that was the best time to be for me because I loved being a patrol sergeant because I could actually be a leader and I could teach young police officers how to really be cops and lead them in in a way that they would be safe. They would get they would get uh, the fulfillment of being a police officer, and it was very fulfilling for me in that role um, because uh, to be a leader in, in policing, there's it's a ton of responsibility, but it's also one of those parts of your career which you can, you literally um, can mold people into being a great cop. So I really enjoyed that part of being, of my career. I, I think I spent 14 years as a police sergeant. Um, then I was, uh, um, in charge of police training for a while, advanced training, and then promoted a lieutenant. And I spent my entire lieutenant's career. Um, the lieutenant's being a lieutenant in, in on the, on the police department in, in Vegas. That's the last rank where you're still on the street. After that, you're an administrator. I never wanted to be an administrator, so I spent my entire lieutenant's career six years as the graveyard lieutenant because in Vegas graveyard shift is where it's happening, right? That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where all the action is happening. 
So I spent my entire uh, lieutenant's career as a graveyard lieutenant. Now, along that way, along that journey, that 24-year journey of being a cop in Vegas, I also was afforded some incredible opportunities that I never would have had anywhere else. And much of that happened because of the TV show Cops. So you're probably all familiar with that show. And I was one of the most featured officers on that show. I did um, actually three seasons on, on that TV show. One, uh, the first as a patrol officer, and then two seasons as a patrol sergeant. So having that exposure um, later played a massive role in my life having that exposure of being on television on one of the most popular shows on television. And that, um, that led to me, uh, one day I'm, I'm on patrol and I get a phone call from a casting director. And this, this casting director says, introduces himself and says, hey, there's gonna be a film shot in Las Vegas. And the director is looking for realism in the part of a police officer. And we saw you on Cops. Would you be willing to come down and do an audition? And I'm always looking for the next adventure, right? So I go to this audition in the old Riviera Hotel here in Vegas. Doesn't even exist anymore. That's I'm dating myself. And uh, walk into the suite, and who's standing there? But Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese. And it was the film Casino. So usually in an audition, I came to find out, I didn't know this at the time, they give you some lines to read. They hand you what they call sides and it's lines to read to see if you, you know, you know how to read a line. But before I could do that, I started telling stories about being a Vegas cop. And I got some pretty good stories. And they, they said, stop, stop, forget the lines. You got the part. And that's how I got into the Screen Actors Guild and became uh, involved in movies and films that I've been doing literally ever since. And it was a pretty good scene that I did with uh, Sharon Stone and Robert De Niro in the movie Casino. So full-time so, Hollywood star, part-time cop now. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I didn't go that far. I did, so the Hollywood bug didn't bite me that bad. Uh, <laughs> but it was a fun hobby. So I did that. I did uh, um, Fool's Rush In with Sama Hayek. I did Miss Congeniality 2 with Sandra Bullock. Um, and I've done literally movies and TV shows, you know, up until, you know, hell, I just, I just did a, a piece on, uh, on uh, murder, murder mysteries, whatever they call that show. I just, anyway, I've been doing TV and movies ever since. Now, how did that happen? Because of the TV show Cops, which I never would have had the opportunity to be on had I not made that decision to move to Vegas. So um, I, I also had life-changing experiences while I was here. And those life-changing experience, everything leads you to a path. And I told you I don't believe in coincidences. And, and I, I've, I've had some life-changing experiences that, um, that have led me to where, where my path is now. One of those life-changing experiences was saving the life of a one-month-old child who was shot in the face in a drive-by shooting. And um, I was on patrol as a sergeant. And uh, right off the strip, I'm on patrol. I see a car up on the sidewalk and there are people running around screaming. I have no idea what's going on, but you know this is a, a, what we call an unknown trouble. And I radio for backup because this could be anything. And I jump out of the car and literally it's mayhem. People are running around, they're screaming. And I look down, there's bullet holes all over this car. And I hear somebody scream, oh my God, the baby's been shot. And I look down and in a little infant seat, there's a one month old baby and the baby's been shot in the face. What had happened was mom and dad Salvadorian immigrants, perfectly innocent of anything, with their one-month-old baby in the car. This is this is about nine o'clock on a, uh, in the evening. They're driving to the market. 
car full of gangbangers pulls up alongside of him for no reason whatsoever. We found out later it was a gang initiation. Just opened fire on the car. And they riddled the car with bullets. And the only person they hit was the baby. Now, I'm looking down at this baby. Her, her head's the size of a softball. And she's been devastatingly injured. And the protocol is you call an ambulance and they then they do the, the medical stuff. But I realize that this baby is not breathing. And if I don't do something and get her to the hospital, this baby's going to die. So I violated protocol. And the first patrol car that got there, I scooped her up and I said, get to the hospital. Radio, we're bringing in a baby that's not breathing. And we have a fantastic trauma center here. So I'm examining the child. Her face is blue. She's not breathing. The bullet had hit her in the face and, and all the tissue and blood had gone down her throat and choked her. I was able to scoop that out with my finger and then give her mouth to mouth resuscitation and bring her back. And because I was there, literally within minutes of this happening, she came back and there was no brain damage, which is one, what you really fear when you're giving mouth to mouth to somebody. And brought her back, she started breathing. We got to the hospital, I handed her off and, uh, and saved her life. Well, that moment was, was life-changing. And I went home, I went home that day, and me and a bottle of scotch, well, a bottle of Johnny Walker Black, pulled out a yellow pad, and I wrote this story called Her Name Was Jackie. Now, I didn't have anything to do with it. I just felt like I needed to write it, that this was something I had to do. I had to get this out of my head. And putting it on paper really was cathartic. And I wrote the story, put it in a drawer, and there it sat for several years until the World Trade Center was attacked. And I was, I was very frustrated that I couldn't help. It was, the, it was the most deadly day in history for American law enforcement. 72 cops were killed. And I was thinking, I want to do something for those families. And I thought of that story that was sitting in that drawer. And I said to myself, Randy, every cop I know has a story like that, a story that's impactful. I'm going to ask cops to write those stories. I'm going to put them in a book and I'm going to donate all the royalties to the families of those cops who were killed. And that's exactly what happened. And I don't know if I'm going to come in and change, I'm going to move my camera here for just a moment. And I don't know if you see it right here. That's the book, True Blue, Police Stories by Those Who Have Lived Them. And that NYPD patch was given to me in recognition of that effort. We raised a lot of money for those families. And uh, little did I know that that would start my writing career. And so uh, following that, I've written four other books. And I have another one coming out actually in a couple months. So all, you know, some of the most incredible, devastating experiences that we are subjected to create a, a pathway for us and create something that you would never have never have thought that you would go down that path and uh and that was one of those moments that the saving of that baby literally changed my life forever um to this day to this day uh, that she's now 24 years old. Um, she's my goddaughter. Wow. That's profoundly deep. And obviously, <clears throat> many of the people on this call can 
really feel what you're talking about. Have had those type of type of circumstances. You said that you know so many of those people wrote those book, uh, wrote those stories to put in that book. Yeah. How did yeah. you deal with that, man? And I, it, you know, here it is, 24 years later, 25 years later, and those things still stick with us so much. They're so emotionally impactful that we get choked up telling it, even though there's a happy ending. What did you do other than writing? Or if if that was just it, the modalities to deal with all those traumas that you've come across in your career. You said multiple officer involved shootings, obviously those life saving, life changing, sometimes life losing battles with people in the in the name of service. How have you dealt with those things? You know, um, that's a great question. And and um when when you're dealing with literally life and death situations. Uh, you, at the moment that you are that you are going through that that experience, you're not thinking about that. You're you're acting. You're you are an action person. You have to mitigate the threats. You have to deal with all of that trauma that other people are feeling. And you have to be that stoic person. You have to be the one who is in charge because if you aren't that person then that exacerbates what's already a volatile situation. And you have to be a leader, right? And that's a deep, deep responsibility. But it's one that is, um, it's one that, that as, a, as a cop, you understand what your role is. And that role is to be the leader. And that role is to be the person who, is the rock while other people are losing it you can't because if you do other people's lives are going to be impacted so later on when you're in the privacy of your own home with your own thoughts that's where it hits you that's where you begin breaking it down in your own brain. And sometimes, you know, those experiences, uh, well, they stay with you forever. I mean, believe me, that 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 instance with baby Jackie has never left me. And there, and and I can tell you this as well that um dealing with trauma, and as a cop, you are going to deal with trauma. You are going to see things and you are going to be involved in people's lives that are impacted forever. That's a heavy, heavy responsibility. And it is also your duty. And duty, being duty bound is something that, that, that holds you together, knowing what your duty is. And uh, it doesn't mean that your life isn't affected by it. So that was a life-changing experience for me. And I had, I had several of those through my career. Um, that, that, that had a happy ending, but they sure as hell don't all have happy endings. Um, does, does, uh, so let me stop right now and see if there's anybody that's got questions now, because I know I've been talking a lot and, I've been throwing a lot at you. So before we do that, because these things will generally tend to kind of go in, uh, turn into a big question session. I want to give everybody their time, but there's something super serious that I want to touch on. Number one, thank you so much for being that kind of vulnerable. And we could spend hours talking about all the traumas and how you deal with it, some of the, some of the successes and failures. But I want to plant that nugget just a little bit for what we're about to talk about next. And that's the Wounded Blue. What brought you to the point to found the Wounded Blue? Um, and before you go into that, I just have to say that I was at the first inaugural one in Las Vegas, 2021. And I'll tell you what, it was the most impactful seminar, conference, whatever you want to call it, summit that I've ever been to. And somehow through you, and it's obviously funneled through you, and it just bleeds the, the, the vulnerability and the openness and the authenticity that you just showed right there. But that happened to be the most impactful, selfless vulnerable um, summits or uh, uh, thing, presentations that I've ever been to. Many of these things are 
a lot of sales pitches. Hey, here's what we offer. You know, that's what these classes are. Right. You know, and we're talking about a time where this was the maybe the most traumatizing time for police officers across the country after um, the, the Ferguson incident and all the things that happened there. There was multiple, multiple um, critical incidents that were of high scrutiny um, that, you know, perceptually brought a lot of bad press to police, the uh, police profession. And somehow you were able to bring most of those people together to present, attend, and talk about these incidents. So how did you find the Wounded Blue and how did you get it to be so authentic and not sales pitchy to bring in these type of selfless people? Great question. So um, I think I have to tell one other story because it's, it's, it's kind of important to the trajectory that brought, the, brought me to, the, to uh, create the Wounded Blue. Um, one of the other major impactful moments in my life was, um, was the, my first fatal gunfight. And I was in a toe to toe gunfight with a suspect. Um, there was, a, I was on patrol nine o'clock on a Saturday night. And what we now know as an active shooter took place. Uh, this guy dressed up all in black. Put on a shoulder holster and a pistol, a sword, and went off and started shooting the kids at a high school dance. And I was literally down the street. There was two couples on a double date and they were following this guy and watching him shoot at kids at a high school dance. And they're on the phone with 911. Oh, he's shooting at the kids again. And I was, when the call came out, I was literally a block away. Suspects saw that he was being followed by this car, two people, two, two couples on a double date. And they, they see all this and they call 911. He sees he's being followed and he fires a round that goes through the windshield of the car between the heads of the two couples, at which point the driver said, I've done my civic duty, adios. And I am now pulling onto the street. There's another patrol car that's getting there as I'm getting there. I see these two cops jump out of their cars. They've got the suspect lit up with their spotlights and their headlights. And this guy is walking down the middle of the street, dressed all in black. He's got a gun in his hand, shoulder holster. And I can't hear him, but I know they're screaming, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. And I'm expecting in these next few moments that A, they're going to shoot him. B, he's going to kill himself. C, he's going to run away. D, he's going to surrender. And, I'm, and all this is playing out in seconds. Yeah. And as I pull up, he does something nobody expects. He nonchalantly puts the gun back in his shoulder holster and walks right past those two police officers. <laughs> and I'm going, that's not the way it's supposed to happen. He now starts walking up the an apartment complex driveway. Our air unit is now above us, and they're shining their 80 zillion candle power light on this guy. And he's now walking towards this group of people. I can't let him get to those people. And this is the moment, literally, that I trained for my entire career. At this point, I've been a cop for 14 or so years. I've trained for this moment my entire police life. But using deadly force is not just a professional decision. It's a very personal decision. Because you're going to live with this the rest of your life. And he's walking away from me. His gun is in the shoulder holster. I know that I'm legally justified to shoot him, but I don't want to do it. I want to try and take him physically. So I run after him. He hears me and he turns. When he turns, I try to take him physically, and it doesn't work out so well. And I kick him in the stomach. He goes down, and when he comes up, he brings the gun up like this. And he and I are literally, I had my gun in my hand, and we both fired at exactly the same time. And we are, our gun muzzles are just about touching. And uh, um, I, wa I wasn't wearing my vest. We fire at the same time. I fire two rounds. And then the nightmare happens. My gun jams. Now I'm going click, click, click. And he's going boom, boom, boom. 
And I remember seeing the muzzle flashes and thinking they look like flamethrowers. And I remember thinking, this is what it's like to die. What's it going to feel like when that bullet enters my body? And I've got a gun that's not working. But I've got nowhere to go. I'm in a parking lot. So I roll down onto my back and I'm trying to get my gun to work and he's trying to shoot me. And literally, he's trying to shoot a little piece of asphalt or hit me in the head. And I'm thinking, is that the one? The helicopter is above us. Their rotor wash is, is turning up sticks and stones and they're hitting me in the head. The two police officers that were there at the beginning, they see me go down. They see his muzzle flash. The, the air unit radios officer down, shots fired. They open up on this guy. Their bullets are zinging over my head. And this is a mess. And I got no place to go. And I'm twisting from side to side. He's trying to shoot me. My old partner drives in, sees me on the ground. Here's the radio traffic that, that I've been shot. Tries to run the suspect over with his car, but instead hits these big cement stanchions that were in the way. So his patrol car hits these cement stanchions and it sounds like an explosion. So he, he, he wanted to run the guy over. That didn't work, but it took the suspect's attention away from me long enough to get up and re-engage him. I've now got my gun working and he and I are in a toe-to-toe -to -toe gunfight, it's a hellacious gunfight. We are literally, we're literally feet apart from each other. And I'm shooting and I'm shooting and I'm shooting. I have a 15 round magazine. And I, this is no, I mean, I'm telling you the truth. I thought I must be the world's worst shot because nothing's touching this guy. And then he takes off and he runs. I run after him. My old partner runs after him and he waits around the corner for us. And that's where the gunfight ended. And, uh, um, my first two shots hit him dead in the chest. The autopsy showed that. But it's not like TV. He was dead and didn't know it. Right. But he was, but he was still shooting at me. And so when I now go on television and I talk about the realities of being a cop, and I hear the, you know, some of the media, you know, when they are criticizing why they have to shoot him so many times. Well, it's because it ain't like TV. It ain't like TV. They are a threat until they aren't a threat anymore. And uh, at the end of the day, I wasn't hit by one bullet. Not one of those rounds hit me. And I, I, I can tell you this, that that moment changed me forever. That moment in my life was pivotal and when you ask me how the wounded blue get formed i'm going to tell you why this was germane to that story we all hear about post-traumatic stress we hear about post-traumatic stress disorder we hear about post-traumatic stress injury but here's what we rarely hear about but is very real as well and that is post-traumatic stress growth i fully believe that I became a better cop as a result of this, of living through this experience, because this gave me the journey of why. The journey of why is, why didn't I die that night? Why was I spared? And why was, why did he die and not me? In that, in that moment where literally I should have died. I should have been shot and I wasn't. And that created thinking to me. Well, Randy, okay, you didn't die that night, so why? And that journey to why, I believe that I have answered in my own mind. And that is, I didn't die that night because I have not, I did not finish what I was put here for. Whatever purpose I was put here for, I hadn't finished. And so I realized that um, I had much more to do. Now, of course, then that, that, that gives you the, 
the question, okay, Randy, well, what's your, what, what were you put here to do? And I fully believe this, that I was put here to change the lives of the people that I respect the most, and that's the law enforcement community. So when you ask why and how did the Wounded Blue become, um, the next experience I'm going to tell you will come full circle. I never, I did not intend to retire when I did. I retired after 24 years of service. And the reason I retired was because I suffered a stroke in my police car. And that's what ended my police career. It was the most frightening moment of my life. And as you just heard, I've had a few frightening moments. I'm driving down, I was the watch commander. Watch commander means I was the highest ranking officer on duty on Las Vegas, in Las Vegas. <laughs> And as such, I would always take a patrol officer with me so I could get to know my people. I got this young cop with me. He's never ridden with me before. It's 2.30 in the morning. We're on the Las Vegas Strip. And I'm talking to him like I'm talking to you guys right now. Suddenly, I found my, my brain slowing down. And I started talking slower. And I had, no, I had no control over it. And I knew that I was having a stroke. So I stopped the police car in the middle of the road. I said, get me medical. I'm having a stroke. I got out of the car to go around the passenger side, and I started speaking gibberish. I knew I was speaking gibberish. I had no control over it. And then I lost the ability to speak, and I lost the ability to move, and I crumpled to the pavement. And my career ended on dirty Las Vegas Street with tourists walking by me with their cameras taking my picture. And once again, that angel that was with me throughout my career was with me again. And the blood clot that went through my brain didn't kill me and didn't leave me permanently damaged in the significant ways that it could have. And I survived it. But it ended my police career. Now, I guess I should mention that three weeks prior to this, my mother died in my arms after an illness. I brought her out to live with me after my dad died. She died in my arms. It was the most horrendous, painful experience I think I've ever had. And two months before that, I was in another fatal shooting. So there was a lot going on in my brain. And then they found out that I had a severe heart condition, which led to stroke. And uh, the doctors told me as I'm in the hospital, laying in the hospital, that, uh, Randy, you need to prepare yourself for your own death, which is not what I had anticipated hearing. I can tell you that. I think, okay, I survived this stroke, right? They told me that I had this severe heart condition, and that's what killed my mother. It's what killed my father. It's killed my, most of my family. And suddenly, I'm dealing with my own mortality at the same time. So all this is playing out, right? And then something happened that I never would have expected. My own department turned its back on me and said, we're not paying your medical bills. And I went, what, what do you mean? You have to pay my medical bills. It's the law. Yeah, but uh, we're just not going to. And I was completely unprepared for this. This is a department I gave 24 years of my life to. So I almost gave my life for my city on more than one occasion. And suddenly they're saying, Randy, yeah, um, even though we have to pay your medical bills, we're just not going to do it. And the, the feeling of abandonment, the feeling of being alone, the feeling of being worthless. Betrayal. That, betrayal, that's the word, was so significant to me. I was just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. And it was devastating. And I thought this was just happening to me. Well, I beat him. Um, it took me over a year. I had to get a lawyer. Meanwhile, they ruined my credit. Bill collectors are knocking on my door. I'm no longer welcome at a department that I, you know, was... <laughs> had played such a significant role in. And then I came to find out why they didn't pay my medical bills. 
See, they knew it was going to take about a year or so to beat them. They knew I was going to win. They played a game, and that game was, if we postpone it long enough, maybe he'll die. That's what they were hoping. So, all of this takes place. And then I realize cops started reaching out to me. And this is why it's so significant of all the stuff I did during my career. From being on TV, from being in the movies, from teaching cops all over the country, from being so visible in the law enforcement community, cops started reaching out to me. Randy, I know you don't know me, but I was shot in the line of duty and my chief never even came to visit me in the hospital. They've thrown me away. Randy, I was hit by a car. I can't work anymore and they've just tossed me aside. Randy, I feel alone. I feel abandoned from all over the country. And I realized that this is a national issue and there were no national resources for them. I can't tell you the number of heartbreaking messages I got. Randy, I wish I died that night. At least I wouldn't be a burden to my family. I feel abandoned. I feel alone. I realized I can create something that can touch those lives. And I gave birth to the Wounded Blue because of that. And that's how the Wounded Blue was formed. And since that time, we've held more than 14,000 police officers in five in the last five years. My entire team is made up of cops who have been shot or stabbed or beaten or run over. But every one of them has been fucked up and everyone's been fucked over. And they continue to serve. They continue to serve because that's who they are inside them. And they are heroes. And that's what we do. And that's what the Wounded Blue is. And for those of you on the call and for those of you that are going to watch this, if you can see and feel the passion and credibility and authentic, uh, authenticness of Randy, this is what his entire organization is about. And I would love to talk to you for hours and hours about more about this, <laughs> but just to throw a little niblet out there, if you want to talk to him, Randy is one of the most outgoing, approachable guys. So uh, September 26th through the 30th in Las Vegas, the Wounded Blues having their third annual summit. Um, so I want you to go there. And I don't know if you know this, I'm sure you probably do, but lives were being saved. At least, I didn't go to last year's, but the, the inaugural one, lives were saved in real time. People were talking. There were people there that had planned on killing themselves at this event. There were the people there that were going to help the people that they could and stuff their mouth full of pills at the end of this event. And those people are still around. Those people we've talked to in this group. So um, Michelle, uh, for the Facebook part, we'll put a link to the Wounded Blue down below in the comments. You can click on that and please register. Um, we're working on trying to get a bunch of people from this group uh, there to have a table to, to have the power of our story. And uh, man, thank you so much for your vulnerability. I, it, it's riveting. Your life story is riveting. All the things that you give, your selflessness is, is, is something to behold. Um, so thank you for that. And I'll shut up now because I know a lot of people have uh, want to talk to you and have questions. Uh, and please be honest with us when you uh, are running out of time or whatever. Let us know because I, I think that uh, you, you impacted a lot of people here. And uh, for the, the those that are watching on YouTube or LinkedIn or whatever, please reach out. Um, all these people in this group are, are approachable and you can contact any of us. Uh, Sarah Carell on LinkedIn or The Power of Our Story on YouTube or, or Facebook or LinkedIn. Reach out. Uh, so well, I'll just kind of go in order here the way I've got it on my screen, if that's okay. And we'll start off with uh, Chris and Natalie. Cool. Randy, good to see you, man, as always. Um, for those that haven't been to the Wounded Blue, I was there with Chris first year. And 25 years in law enforcement community, by far the best conference I've ever been to. Unbelievable. Um, absolutely life-changing. Randy, I just sent you a text message to you, by the way. So read that at your leisure. No, no rush. So, <laughs> but dude, hey. seriously, 
Hey, thank you for being here, man. I, I just love you. So yeah, thank you for sharing your stories. Those were amazing. So so moving. <laughs> no, it's a you know. Listen, the the gift of living through these experiences, um, I don't take lightly, and and I understand from my personal from my personal interactions with people that, you know, cops always know, people know when, when you're being bullshitted. And so if you can't be honest and you can't be forthright, you can't be um, open with who you are, then you won't have the impact that you should. So, yeah, I mean, I it's, listen, it's, it's, it's not easy to talk about some of these stories. Reliving some of these things is not an easy thing to do. But it's incumbent upon me. It's my responsibility. And so sometimes, even though it's difficult, um, it's it's something that I have to do. So I, I don't take I don't I don't take this responsibility lightly. Well, if you've written four books, that's obvious. And that's good. <laughs> the the writing it down is cathartic and it is a good way to share your story. So thank you for that. Absolutely. And just for those that are watching and those that are going to be watching, you can see that a man with 34 years of service, this still has permanent impact on people. So understand that that's a normal thing and that's real. Don't be ashamed of that. That is part of the lifelong process that this is going to be. Mr. Oakley. You're on mute, sir. Randy, there you go. Randy, you're not going to believe this, but I want to say hi to a secret alumni. Oh my God! You went to see her. I'm second, hundred and second municipal class. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Hold up. Stand by. <laughs> Another small world story in real time. How about this? Hundred fifty eighth municipal class. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to meet you, brother. Glad to meet you. <laughs> Wow. Did you have a question, Rich, for him? No, I just wanted to, to get that out there to him, you know. That's fantastic. Uh, Randy, you were off, but that's another small world story that we're talking about. They, they happen all over the place. Thank you for uh, sharing that, man. Rich, that was awesome. Janet, what do you got? I just want to say thank you. And uh, actually, I had planned to come last year. But when you moved the venue, I, it was too hard for me to get there from Canada. So it, it was a lot of different things. Vegas is, is good. Um, I'm going to try and get this year. Not likely, but the following year. But everything you say resonates. And, and sorry, um, I was with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as an emergency dispatcher. My husband is a retired RCMP member as well. So. Um, we have stories and I, I'm so grateful you shared yours. Thank you. And the one thing that impacted me is some of the stories where they say, I wish I had died because that's definitely one of my nights too. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chris, for hosting. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say this again, because I've never heard this before. So I'm going to put a little spotlight on this thing. Post-traumatic stress growth. That too is a real deal. And I don't think that we've necessarily titled. We've talked about resiliency and things like that. But this post-traumatic stress growth is why we all have, that we're relatable, is why people uh, will come to us because we've had those experiences and survived them and are continuing to survive them and really kind of embrace them. So I really like that, Randy. I hope that that part's in your next book that you come out with. Michelle. It, it, oh, it go ahead. Real. And no, it, it post-traumatic stress growth is something that we need to embrace and we need to celebrate because it is a it is the antithesis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. It's the Kintsugi bowl. I always say the Kintsugi bowl. <laughs> and Randy, someday we'll spend some time together, but yeah, everything you're saying I can relate to and uh it's just, we don't have the time. And Michelle has, she's special too. So everyone Thank here. You. 
Um, hi, Randy. So I just want to say thank you. I, I think I've been on the edge of like just letting a river of tears flow from my eyeballs this whole entire past hour. Um, I was a dispatcher for 14 years and on 2021, January 2021, I was diagnosed with PTSD from a, the topping on the cake was a traumatic incident for my, with my department that I worked and it was with Henderson Police Department. So I know a lot of the stuff that happened with Vegas and just knowing the amount of calls and everything, I can only imagine how much you haven't told us, but I would love to be able to go to your, your summit and I'm hoping maybe by next year, I'll be ready to go back on my old stomping grounds, but I have since moved to Idaho and I'm not quite ready to go back to the Vegas Henderson area. But I wanted to ask you, as you start to, when you started to grow into this, realizing your, your mission, your purpose is to do more and you, you get on this path of starting the wounded blue, I'm kind of on that like bordering edge of finding my next calling in life. And I'm sure you had setbacks or triggers. How did you deal with maybe the tough stuff that came along when you're when you came so much from so much trauma yourself? Well, the, yeah, I mean, there were tr with are you talking about with creating this organization? Or are you talking yeah, about or okay. And maybe even before that, when you started just getting calls from other officers and realizing, you know, people needed help out there. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, I, like I said, I thought I was the Lone Ranger. I thought I was the only guy getting fucked, up, fucked over by my department. <laughs> and, and then when I realized, wow, this is happening all over the country. What, how can, how can people who have given their lives in service be treated, be betrayed by the very agencies and the very cities and communities that they sacrificed so much for, both physically and emotionally and psychologically. I have a strong belief in right and wrong, and I know what's right and I know what's wrong. And sometimes you gotta be willing to stand up you got to be willing to say, I'm drawing the line. And it's been, believe me, I've had, I've had so many ups and downs and sideways and challenges in creating this organization and seeing it follow through. Just listen, raising money to, to continue our operations is a constant, constant battle. I can't tell you the number of companies that I've gone to. Randy, we really love what you're doing, but it's the police, man. We can't put our name on that. And the number of chiefs or police administrators who have turned their backs on their own cops. So I'm constantly doing battle. I don't know if you guys know, but I'm also commentator for Fox News and, and other news sources as a police commentator. And I don't hold back. Watching the betrayal, seeing how it affects those who, because you know what, when, you, when you're a cop, you enter the service, dispatch. I got to tell you, I got, for dispatchers that are on this, you people are the unsung heroes of law enforcement. You truly, truly are. How you can, how you can be on that phone and be, the, the, be that calming voice, be that calming voice on that radio, when, when things are going to shit is truly a talent and you don't get enough credit for it. So I'm a huge believer in, in the, in the service of, of communications people. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it truly the unsung heroes. Well, if we're to take this responsibility seriously, then we have to give, what we can for the sake of others. And that's 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 really the long and short of it. I know what my responsibility is. I know what I was, I know the mission that I was put here for now. And so as painful as it is sometimes, the challenges, the 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 challenges of having a nonprofit 
good lord the challenges I, I never expected it i've been a cop my whole life i never anticipated being here but this is what we have to battle we have to be warriors we have to be warriors and that means we have to face those challenges and then defeat them well i truly appreciate that and this is my first time really like being introduced to you. I didn't know anything about you before tonight or before this week. And so I just want to say the way that you can tell your story to make us still feel the emotion and the passion behind what you do, but not break down and make it unintelligible for people to follow or anything. It's, <laughs> it's truly an inspiration coming from someone who is still trying to figure out her story. So thank you. My pleasure power of our story and how impactful these things are in real time. Thank you for that question, Catherine. Uh, or Michelle, Catherine. Randy, thank you. Yeah, just to echo what Michelle said, you're definitely a gifted, a gifted speaker. Um, and thank you for sharing. That was really, everything was so moving um, and inspirational. And my question is actually kind of a, an easy one. Um, but I'm here in Philadelphia and I've got a whole family of Philadelphia police officers. Um, and so, oh my just, God. So these poor people that are in Philadelphia, you got Larry Krasner, that freaking moron. And then you got that re retarded woman who is in charge of the department, Danielle Outlaw. God help you. Well, luckily, most of the guys in my family are retired now, and they're very grateful to be. Um, <laughs> my question was actually why you decided to go out to Las Vegas instead of just hopping over to Philadelphia if you wanted action. So I was, um, uh, here's what happened. I made the decision that I was going to go someplace that had more action. This is 1986. And I went down to Fort Lauderdale and I, I was offered a job in Fort Lauderdale, but they let me ride with them for a few shifts. And I saw, I saw some stuff that I said, mm, I don't want to go to a department like that. And uh, I happened to be telling some stories about my ride alongs at a detectives association meeting in, in New Jersey. And two FBI agents came up to me afterward and said, if you're looking for a place that's got a great police department, that is, that is top-notch, great training, and there's a lot of action, go to Vegas. And so I came out to Vegas, and that's how it happened. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Catherine. Chaplain Todd. Hey, Randy. Todd Stewart, uh, third generation first responder. Uh, I carry the first two generations with me right there. My dad my grandfather both. King County, Washington Sheriff's deputies. Um, 60 years between them. My dad had 35 years, 28 with King County Sheriff's and seven with the Washington State Attorney General putting sex predators away. Um, and, uh, you know, your storytelling, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mann says the the two most impactful stories you can tell the stories you don't want to tell anybody else. And the most impactful story that you can tell is the story you don't want to tell yourself. And I, I get the feeling that your stories have come out of that file. Um, I've been trying to get my dad to tell his stories. Um, you know, 28 years, uh, 11 is a motor patrolman uh spent a lot of years in the sex crimes unit uh homicide and robbery and then uh, investigating predatory sex offenders uh with the uh the attorney general and then before him my grandfather was the founding commander of the white center detachment of the king county sheriff's reserves there are so many stories there that need to be told and, uh, you know, I never, I've, I, I have never been able to talk to my dad about the impact that his service had on him. He seems to have come out of it pretty well, but he did have a, a drinking problem for a while. He hasn't had a drink for a couple of years, but 
he's still never really gotten to a point where where i mean i can't even imagine i've heard a few and they were pretty darn crazy um but i would really like to be able to get those stories from my dad well he's from the old school join the <laughs> department the year i was born yeah, he's from the old school where you didn't talk about stuff. Um and and to and to get to get the old school folks to delve back into those memories, sometimes it's not a good thing. Yeah. Because they tamp them down for a reason. And if you open up that you open up that that can, um it can either be a good thing or it can be a not so good thing. So everybody deals with their traumas in their own way. And if he's not self-destructive, if he's not uh, an unhappy man, um, I would say, let him be. Um, ask him. If he tells you, he tells you. If he, do if he doesn't, don't pry it out of him. It's not, it's, 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 it's his at the moment when he thinks it's okay to do, he will do it. And if he never does, that's okay too. He survived it that long. And if he doesn't have the support system or the plan in place to un un unearth those things, uh, like Randy said, that could be uh, more, more critically uh, negatively impactful than it could be a, 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 a positive. Yeah. Uh, and I'm right there. I can put him through the trauma resiliency protocol. Yeah. Sarah, did you have anything before we wrap this up? I well, I can tell I missed an amazing talk. I can't wait to listen to the video. Um, Randy, I'm just so appreciative of you coming on. I I hope we can be part of the conference coming up and and just all of, you know, as many people as possible come meet you in person. Um, yeah, thank you for all you do. And Chris, thank you so much for facilitating. And Michelle uh, recording. Thank you. Absolute honor. Does anybody else have any other questions? One last time. Here. Um, I do. I just want to make a quick comment. Can you guys hear me? Ready. Yep. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm in the middle of the store. Um, I just wanted to say, Randy, we never met, but I we know of your work. And as a nurse for the past 36 years who also violated policy to carry a baby that was life or death into an emergency room. <laughs> Um, when you explained that, I felt that all over again. And I wanted to say I've also done the whole, you know, betrayal by employer and um, I'm forgetting the word. Um, but I, you know, I, I think one thing I want to say is that while we're all a part of the group and most of the people in this group know me, um, oftentimes we miss the signs and folks that are the closest to us. So for everyone in this group who's on this, I want to say, make sure you reach out to those who you think are strong, because some of them that you think are strong are not as strong as they are. And I'm not referring to myself. I'm good. It's just the emotions. But please check in on your strong friends. I, I'm, can I let me say something that that um, from a, a peer support point of view, you know, that's that's our, our mainstay is peer support. Um, my entire team of people, um, like I said, we've helped 14,000 police officers over the last five years. And and peer support is um, when you're when you're listening to the pain of others, you can't help but absorb some of that pain yourself. And that's why self help is so vital. We need to watch out for each other. And when we are struggling, as we sometimes will, having that support system, having that person that you can call and say, you know what, you know, some of this Brandy said, kind of brought up some feelings that I really didn't expect. Having that conversation is vital to our own well-being. So never hesitate to do that. Self-help is so incredibly important. 
Oh, no, absolutely, Randy. And I just wanted to say I didn't mention it. I do work with suicide prevention and law enforcement, and I'm the nurse that a lot of people talk with. So I understand all of that. And I hear the stories and I know the stories and I've been through the stories. So I think my main thing on top of everything that you said is just check in on those that you that you know, you know, some of them are not as strong as they pretend to be in the public eye. For sure. Awesome. Thank you for that, Brenda. And Randy, uh, for the group and for those that will watch, is it okay to post your email address in the Wounded Blue uh, uh, link in, in the comments? 100%. Randy at thewoundedblue.org. And Michelle and will put that in the comments as well. And, here, and here's what I ask. I ask that any of you that, that are available to come to the third annual National Law Enforcement Survival Summit come. Now, I'm going to tell you this. This is going to be some of the most incredible presenters you've ever seen. Um, th th this is life-changing stuff. But at the same time, remember, one of my jobs was I was in charge of advanced training for the Metropolitan Police, ninth largest police department in the country. I've been to hundreds of police training conferences. Most of them aren't really memorable. Most of them, they're, they're kind of dry. Well, when we put on a conference, it isn't. So we're gonna have fun at this conference as well. The first night, I've got Vinny Montez, the comedian, is gonna be performing in the comedy club at the hotel we're staying at, the Ahern Hotel. So we've got him. I've got a very famous Hollywood actor who you will recognize instantly. I'm not gonna tell you his name because it's a surprise. <laughs> who is going to be one of the speakers at this conference, who's one of the best motivational speakers I've ever seen in my life. He's going to be there. I've got the last night, Thursday night, I'm sorry, Friday night, we're having, I, I don't know how I did this, but I talked the hotel into paying for a concert by the number one ACDC tribute band in the nation. And we're going to have a concert like no other. So not only is this going to be an incredible conference because of the people involved, the people who are speaking, the people who are attending, but we're going to have a hell of a lot of fun at the same time. And we can do it all. And that's what the Wounded Blue is about. I ask you to go to thewoundedblue.org. If, uh, if you can donate 10 bucks a month, I'm asking you to do that. Um, we're, we're on a drive now to, to get uh, people to put in that 10, 10 bucks a month because we we need to we need to raise money for the organization. If you know people who want to um, become involved with us and maybe be a um, a sponsor, send them my way because we're uh, we're looking for sponsorship as well. So we don't turn people away. I I heard today from a I was turned on to a guy that his son was killed. His son was a cop down in New Mexico was murdered um three weeks ago and he's suffering and uh person at the wounded blue helped contacted him and he called me today and uh he doesn't have the money so we're paying for it and he's coming to the wounded blue he's coming to the wounded blue conference so you know people who need it you know people who are just not they don't even need to be struggling this we we created this conference to prepare people so they wouldn't have to face the pain that they would be armed with the information. They'd be armed with the knowledge that there are people that care. That's what this conference is all about. So tell your friends, tell your coworkers. I got about 50 more seats that I would like to fill. And uh, please, I can use your help doing that. Awesome. Randy, someone had a question. Is Will the, uh, will the uh, summit be uh, streamed or recorded at all? No, and I'll tell you why not. We originally anticipated doing that. Unfortunately, in the realities of our new world, some of the presenters have been targeted. And when they streamed stuff, there, were, there was video taken from the streaming, and then it was turned around. It was actually uh, 
utilized to try and destroy their careers. So as a result of that, the only people that, that are going to be able to see this and participate and feel it are those who are actually in the room. And let me just say this one other thing about the Wounded Blue. It's not just a summit thing. This is like an everyday year round thing that they do. They have their own peer support team, which is phenomenal. Uh, if I if I remember correctly, you guys are also uh, advocating and helping uh, support uh, service animals for people that need them. Is that correct? Well, you want to hear something heartbreaking? This is just this. This happened yesterday. We uh, we ha we had a relationship with an incredible man here locally, veterinarian named Dr. Bivens, and who's also a reserve police officer. And he is the he is the veterinarian to the French bulldog community. And what he facilitated for us were um, French bulldogs, which you know are thousand fifteen hundred dollar dogs, yeah. being given to us for emotional support animals. And I got to tell you, they are they are innately emotional support animals. Sunday, he was at Lake Mead, and he drowned, and now he's dead. I'm just I I'm I'm in I'm in disbelief. A man who was so giving, who was so incredibly positive, who did so much for others in a freak accident, wow. drowned at Lake Mead. So yeah, so I'm I'm just and that's awful. I'm, I I got I met Aaron Terrell's little Frenchie, and he's just an awesome little companion for Aaron. Yep. Well, if everyone can send positive thoughts and prayers for that family, uh, for that healing, uh, that's 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 tragic and horrific. Uh, Natalie, Chris, you had another question. Yeah, we're going to shift gears a little bit back to the positive side, if we can. Just for guys that haven't been there before, I will personally guarantee, just like year one, Chris Gregorio on stage singing. So <laughs> if you haven't seen that before, it's worth going just for that. So yeah. <laughs> And I really want to go, but the Iowa Peer Support Foundation Wellness Conference is the same week here in West Des Moines. So I'll be busy with that. But man, at least I get to see Vinny at the uh, First Responders Bridge Retreat next weekend. He he uh, he performs uh, there at our at our uh, weekend retreats for first responders and their spouses he does his show uh he, he's an awesome guy <laughs> he's awesome. funnier than hell rich you have one final thing Randy, randy i forgot to tell you that the 102nd municipal class started 1 september 1967 god damn <laughs> that's ancient history <laughs> wow back in the day no ballistic vest. Good. No, I said under a hundred, no so I did good. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I bought the fabric. Well, I guess we can use another the million for somebody else as well, Randy. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Randy, do you have any uh, closing thoughts that you'd like to throw out there, man? You know, I think I've uh, I think I put it all out there. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, it uh, it's energizing for me to be able to talk to folks that are caring and understanding and um you know are, are playing positive roles in our community so uh um i appreciate it thank you sarah for inviting me and uh, anytime you guys want to talk i am here thank you so much and thank you for showing the absolute vulnerability and uh the authenticity that it just reinforces the power of our story and what you do um so thank you so much I, it was a great conversation i'm absolutely humbled that you're here um you're one of the most giving people that i've ever met in my life in this realm man so so thank you for all that of your service that you gave and that you continue to do in another way and, and and in my experience this this realm is actually more fulfilling in so many ways than you know than the other way of serving that we traditionally do so thank you for that and for those that are going to be watching and you're watching this, join us at the Power of Our Story to join this tribe, to help have impact on other people. And join us at the Wounded Blue 
like he said, if you can donate, join the monthly club, um, be part of the Wounded Blue. Reach out. They never turn anybody away. The power of our story never turns anybody away. So please come and join us. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here. And we look forward to uh, meeting you and helping you and having you help us. Thank you so much.